Good evening, tributes. I hope you're all ready for some more tales of the Hunger Games. So without further ado, let's continue. Literary gore and spoilers will follow. The 56th Games took place in Scottish Highlands. They featured Loch Monsters, Loch Drain, and lasted for eight days. This year, the game makers forked out a small fortune for a more unusual arena. As part of a secret diplomatic visit, President Snow had recently visited the European land of Scotland and had become particularly obsessed with the landscape. This year's victor was Earth Goldstein, aged 14, from District 3. During the countdown to the gong, almost all of the tributes were looking around in confusion at the arena that surrounded them, with the landscape not resembling any past arena or any place in Panem that they had ever seen before. However, Earth made herself focus on the cornucopia and anything useful that she could take. Upon closer inspection, she noticed that this cornucopia area contained many jagged rocks that were hidden beneath the damp grass. So as the sound of the gong approached, she found herself planning a path that she could take in order to avoid tripping over these rocks. When the gong sounded, Earth ran towards the supplies like the vast majority of the other tributes. However, she was one of few tributes who did not trip over the rocky terrain on her way to the centre. In fact, there were many accidental injuries that occurred in the first 10 seconds, with Lisbeth from 12 banging her head onto a particularly jagged rock just six seconds after the gong, which made her the first tribute to die this year. Earth quickly arrived at the centre of the cornucopia and grabbed a loaf of bread. She scanned around and observed Alexander from two stabbing tributes with a knife, and Nicola from two grabbing tributes by the hair and smashing their heads into the rocks. She also noticed that unlike previous years, there were no water bottles present. Just as Earth considered grabbing a sleeping bag, she made eye contact with Brocade from one, who started running straight towards her with an axe in his hand, and so she fled from the cornucopia across the nearest valley, until she had run far enough that she was able to stop and rest on top of a nearby rocky hill. For the rest of this first day, Earth stayed at the top of the hill, which gave her a decent view of the rest of the arena, and allowed her to see other tributes fighting and fleeing in various directions. That afternoon there was a torrential rainstorm, and she used the leaves of a nearby plant in order to funnel enough water to adequately satisfy her thirst. However, as there had been no water bottles present at the cornucopia, Earth guessed that the water in the lochs was not poisonous, and so she planned to drink from them once she needed to. Over the next day, Earth was tempted to travel and explore the arena, but did not want to risk encountering the career pack, who seemed particularly bloodthirsty this year. She stayed hidden at the top of the hill, and sometimes spotted them running after various tributes before slaying them in rather sadistic manners. However, when Earth awoke on the third day, she was extremely thirsty and decided to drink some water from the loch. She carefully headed down the hill, but as she was turning the corner of a rod of the large rock, she was knocked to the floor by Figs from Seven. Earth immediately tried to push Figs off her back, but realised that he was too heavy. In a futile effort to have someone rescue her, she screamed out, but to her surprise, Figs immediately shifted his weight from her and simply covered her mouth with his finger. As Earth was trying to understand why Figs had not killed her, Harvest and Aratra, both from Nine, appeared from behind another rock. Figs helped Earth back up and Aratra tended to the wound that Earth had just received on her forehead, whilst Harvest explained to her that they had just attacked her as they heard someone approaching and were planning on ambushing them in case it was the careers. Whilst Earth was processing this information, Harvest said that she could have some of their water and they would not kill her if she shared her remaining bread with them and took the first watch that night. Earth had no option other than to accept this offer, however she was also pleased to have allies in the short term at least, especially as they were all bigger and older than her, and could potentially protect her from future attacks from other tributes. The group worked effectively together for the rest of the day, and even managed to trap and kill Victoria from five, when they ambushed her by the rocks where they had previously ambushed Earth. That evening, they slept on top of one of the nearby hills, and as agreed, Earth took the first watch. However, during the victor's interview, she admitted that as she sat there in the dark that night, she thought about how she was clearly the weakest link in this group, and how they would be likely to kill her without much hesitation if they needed to. About half an hour into her watch, and when Harvest, Aratra and Figs were all fast asleep, Earth saw some figures approaching in the distance. Judging by the outline and respective heights, she realised that it was the careers, Alexander and Nicola. At this point, Earth realised that even though she would like to have these allies for longer, they would likely turn on her soon, and now was her chance to have them taken out first. Through the night sky, Earth saw the outline of these two figures approaching faster, 
and she realised that she had to act fast, but that she could not walk back down the hill as she would walk straight towards them. Therefore she very carefully climbed a few feet down the rock face of the nearby cliff and grabbed on as tightly as she could to some of the rocks that jutted out of this cliff. A minute went by and rocks would sometimes crumble under Earth's feet and take several seconds to hit the ground far below. She later admitted that this felt like a lot longer than five minutes that she was gripping to the side of the cliff. However, Alexandra and Nicola arrived soon after, and Earth heard a few screams before she heard knives chopping away at flesh and the screams abruptly ending before three cannons sounded. She was desperately waiting for Alexandra and Nicola to leave so that she could get back up to solid ground, but Nicola asked Alexander where the fourth one was. Alexander said that he could have sworn that there was another, but that he must have been mistaken about this, before a scream rang out from a nearby loch, which was in fact Brocade murdering Jose from Ten. This scream sent Alexandra and Nicola running away back down the hill, which allowed Earth to get back up from the cliff and relax in a heap of relief. The next day, with ten tributes left, Earth stayed at this vantage point at the top of the hill. However, she soon realised that all of the group's supplies, except for an empty water bottle, had been taken by Nicola and Alexander. As she felt thirsty soon after she awoke, she hastily headed to the loch and retrieved some water with Aratra's bottle. She thought she could see something moving within the water, but just as she was about to run back to the top of the hill, a hand grabbed her round the neck and pulled her backwards from the water. Earth yelped out, but she was shocked to see that it was her district partner, Kai, who had pulled her backwards. She hurriedly asked him why he had grabbed her, then a loch monster immediately emerged from the water and jutted its long neck at the pair, although luckily for them, its neck was not quite long enough to reach them. Earth screamed and Kai once again covered her mouth before pulling her by the arm and running away with her up a nearby hill. Once they had hidden and had their breath back, Earth asked Kai what the creature was that they had just seen, and he explained that he had no idea, but that there was one in each loch, which would try to eat tributes if they spent too long nearby. Earth and Kai told each other about their experiences so far, and they shared Earth's water and some cheese that Kai had managed to steal from the careers. As the afternoon went by, they walked to the perimeter of the arena, but just as they walked around a rather large crag, they were simultaneously knocked unconscious. When Earth regained consciousness, she heard Kai's voice frantically asking why he and Earth had been tied up. But when she opened her eyes, she realised that they had been tied each side of a tree by Alexandra and Nicola. Nicola then informed Kai and Earth that they were lucky to have not been killed, seeing as they were from District 3 and they would be able to move mines from the cornucopia to a nearby clearing, which lots of tributes had passed through and would likely pass through again. Over the rest of the day, Kai and Earth were forced to dig up some of the mines from the cornucopia and move them to a nearby clearing, which lots of tributes had indeed walked through. This was a very fragile process and was especially difficult for Earth, seeing as at her age she had only been taught the basics of bomb disposals. However, by sundown they eventually had all the mines in place and as requested, Kai had used some of the mine's electrical components in order to make a remote control for the explosion. As Nicola and Alexander ate dinner, with the latter feeding Kai and Earth, who were once again tied up to a tree, Nicola asked Alexander if he thought they still needed both of the threes. Without much thought, Alexander shook his head, and almost instantly Nicola finished her mouthful, marched over to Kai, and snapped his neck, killing him, before Earth had even registered what was going on. Earth screamed out in sorrow as Kai's body was retrieved by a hovercraft, and as she slept that night, she hatched a plot for revenge. The next day when they woke, Nicola and Alexander led Earth up to the top of a nearby hill so that they could all see the clearing below. Whilst Nicola and Alexander were avidly watching the clearing containing the mines, Earth managed to sneak up a small rock in case the pair attacked her. After a few hours, they finally saw Heather from Eleven walking through the clearing and Alexander got ready to press the detonation button on the remote control. However, when Heather was in place and Alexander pressed the detonation button, the mines did not explode but instead, Alexander's hand was blown off and straight into Nicola's face. Alexander shrieked in agony, and Earth quickly knocked out Nicola with her rock before she ran away. The day before, it had not been shown to viewers that whilst Nicola and Alexander had been arguing with each other shortly after Kai's death, Earth had managed to defuse a mine and take some of the explosive material before wiring it to the detonation button within the remote control. Alexander died a few minutes later, by the time that Earth had already fled. The next day, with six tributes left, the water from the loch suddenly drained just as Earth was waking up. 
She was in fact awakened by a strange sound that turned out to be the Loch Monsters. As she watched each of them now slowly plodding through the arena, she spotted Colorado from Six running across an adjacent hill from one of these monsters who was waddling towards him, before he misjudged his position and slipped off the side of the hill, which was immediately followed by the sound of his bones cracking and then his cannon. Earth therefore decided to remain on the high ground for the next two days in order to avoid this mysterious yet deadly monsters. On the eighth day, Earth was awoken by another cannon, which turned out to be that of Heather, who had just been stabbed to death by Nicola. Just as Earth was trying to figure out who was left, she was suddenly lashed by hail that hurtled down from above. She noticed that it seemed to be coming from behind her, and then it dawned on her that this was probably the game maker's way of trying to bring the remaining three tributes back together. Earth then ran as quickly as she could to a drained loch, which seemed to be clear of the hail, but just as she entered the basin of the loch, she saw Nicola just metres in front of her, slashing Brocade's throat with a knife. Realising that this was probably when she would now be eliminated, Earth breathed slowly before Nicola turned round and grinned her creepy smile at her. As Earth was gradually approached by Nicola, who was deliberately walking very slowly towards her, she noticed a Loch Monster behind Nicola, which seemed interested in her. As Nicola taunted Earth, the monster lowered its long neck, which was now coming nearer and nearer towards Nicola. Earth realised that she needed to stall Nicola for at least a few seconds, whilst the Loch Monster was continuing to lower its neck towards her. She asked Nicola if she could ask one final question, and Nicola rolled her eyes and nodded. Earth asked, Do you ever think you talk too much? Nicola laughed, and then just as she was about to charge straight at Earth, the Loch Monster grabbed Nicola in its mouth by the hood of her jacket. She let out a shrill scream and shouted at the monster to let her down, but within seconds it was eating her whole, as the sound of her scream slowly morphed into the crunching of her bones. After Nicola's cannon sounded, the remaining Loch monsters waddled straight past Earth and back to the cornucopia, whilst the game makers announced that Earth was this year's victor. After realising that she had just won, Earth fainted in shock before being collected by the hovercraft. After winning her games, Earth finished her studies and went on to teach at District 3's Academy of Higher Education before getting married and having three children. However, she was later killed in the Victor's Purge of 75. The 57th games took place on a stony island. They featured poisonous crabs, a tsunami, and lasted for 11 days. This year's games reminded viewers that stealth could often be the most powerful weapon of all. This year's games were won by Yvette Lee, age 15, from District 5. During the training week before the games, Yvette decided not to practice that many skills, but instead she chose to spend most of her time at the survival station, where she could spend time observing the other tributes and identifying their strengths and weaknesses. When the podiums raised, Yvette spotted a knife that was nestled in the grass with its blade sticking out from behind a rock just metres from her podium. When the gong went off, she waited a second so that she would be less likely to be knocked over by another tribute as they also ran to the cornucopia. She then proceeded to grab this hidden knife and immediately revealed herself to be the dark horse of this year's games when she ran up behind Pius from 2 and stabbed him in the neck, just as he was about to kill Carrie from 4, who was cowering from him on the nearby ground. Within the split second that followed, Yvette considered reaching down to stab Carrie, but then remember that Carrie had been very proficient with fishing skills and using rope, and this may come in useful for Yvette later. Therefore she grabbed the water bottle that Pius had dropped, and Carrie then ran away. Yvette then looked to her right and saw Pekin from Eleven continually stabbing his district partner, Heaven. Noticing that he was distracted, Yvette ran up behind him and stabbed him through the back of the head, making him drop a loaf of bread as he fell to the floor. As Yvette was about to reach down to grab this loaf, Hypatia from Two, through a knife which hit her in the shoulder. Yvette saw Hypatia getting ready to throw another knife, so she quickly ran away at a perpendicular angle to her, before managing to escape from the main cornucopia clearing, albeit with an intense pain in her shoulder. As Yvette travelled away from the raised central area of the arena, she heard eight cannons sounding, and once she had made it far enough from the cornucopia, she removed the knife from her shoulder, whilst managing to not scream out through the intense pain. Luckily for her, it was sunny weather, and so she didn't need her jacket at the time. She therefore ripped off a section of the sleeve and made it into a bandage, which she stuck to her shoulder. Later that day, she made it to the edge of the cornucopia and looked over the hill to see the rocks that were scattered amongst the seaside. 
Yvette closely examined the rocks and found many small crevices in the gaps between them, which could make for decent hiding places, and therefore she decided to rest in this area for as long as possible. Whilst hiding within the rocks for the next two days, Yvette noticed a rather menacing species of small orange crab that would sometimes come close to her before running away when she neared it. Despite her ever-increasing hunger, she thought she recognised these crabs as being poisonous from her training the week before. Therefore, she did not try to eat them, but aimed to find out if they were in fact poisonous. The next day, as Yvette woke, she peeked her head out from the rocks and saw Sergio from Twelve in the distance, slowly walking in her direction. She could just about see that despite having initially been a larger boy, he seemed somewhat emaciated and was trying to grab something that appeared to be moving, which Yvette guessed was the crabs. Being slightly more agile, Yvette quickly captured one of the crabs and then knocked it dead with a stone, before leaving it on top of one of the rocks and hiding, in the hope that Sergio would find this crab and eat it. After a few minutes of waiting behind a rock that was close to the dead crab, Yvette was relieved to see that Sergio finally spotted the crab. He practically charged across the rocks towards it, and then grabbed it before ripping off its claws and shoving them into his mouth without a second thought. Yvette waited until Sergio started moving again, at first walking, and then desperately chasing after a nearby cast of crabs, who continued to scurry away. Yvette continued watching him for a few more minutes, until she saw him start to cough, at first lightly, but as she moved closer she realised that he was in fact coughing blood, almost without stopping. And now realising that these crabs were in fact poisonous, Yvette snuck up on Sergio, and whilst he was in the middle of a particularly violent coughing fit, she stabbed him in the neck, thereby killing him, but also saving him from the slow and painful death that would have ensued. Yvette therefore decided to avoid the crabs and any other type of animals within the arena, which could also be poisonous. As the fourth day began, her hunger intensified, but when she turned another corner, she was able to see the silhouettes of Carrie and Monroe, both from four, in the distance, fishing by the rocks. She knew that it would be a risk to approach them, but she was now desperate for food, and she had also saved Carrie's life during the bloodbath, and so she hoped that this would be taken into account. As Yvette gradually approached the pair with her hands raised in the air to prove that she was empty-handed, Monroe readied his fishing rod in order to potentially use it as a weapon. However, when Yvette was close enough, she noticed that there did not seem to be any water bottles in their pile of supplies, and therefore she asked if she could have some of their fish in exchange for her water. Without taking his eyes off Yvette, Monroe asked Carrie if he should kill her there and then, but Carrie told him that they needed water, and that it was Yvette who had saved her during the bloodbath. Monroe said that he would accept as long as he could take Yvette's knife. Despite this being a huge disadvantage for Yvette, she was by now famished, and so she was practically forced to accept this offer. However, the alliance worked well for all three tributes, and over the next two days they were able to eat, drink, and feel relatively secure. However, as the number of tributes dwindled to ten, Yvette considered that Carrie and Monroe might soon want to end the alliance. On the evening of the fifth day, Yvette said that she needed to relieve herself, and she walked round the corner where the trio usually did this. But instead of continuing and going to relieve herself, she waited nearby and then heard Monroe talking to Carrie about their plans for Yvette. She was shocked to hear Monroe asking Carrie if he could kill Yvette that evening, but even more shocked to hear Carrie saying that it would be better to do it tomorrow evening. As Yvette relieved herself, she made a plan to kill the pair before they killed her. While she was still out of their sight, she cornered one of the crabs and broke off its venomous pincers, before very carefully placing them in her pocket without letting them touch her skin. Once she returned to Carrie and Monroe, she acted as normally as she could. Later that evening, when the pair were fishing for their supper, Yvette removed the pincers and squeezed out as much of the venom as she could into the remaining water in the bottle. The three sat down to eat whilst it was getting dark, and Monroe and Carrie both asked for some of the water. In order to not arouse suspicion, Yvette drank some of it as well. However, very shortly after drinking it, she excused herself, saying that she needed to relieve herself again. Once she had turned the corner, she ran as quickly as she could until she believed that she was out of earshot of Monroe and Carrie, and then she forced herself to vomit and hence purge herself with the crab's venom from the water that she had drunk. Once she had finished, Yvette returned to the dinner, and after a few minutes, Carrie and Monroe started coughing. At first it was not too serious, but after a minute or so they were almost unable to stand up. When Carrie started coughing blood, Monroe shouted that Yvette had poisoned them, and he grabbed the knife, ready to stab Yvette. However, as Monroe got up and Yvette backed away, he coughed so heavily that he fell over and knocked himself unconscious on a rock. Within a minute, both their cannons had sounded, and Yvette grabbed all their supplies, then ate her remaining fish as she continued walking down the beach. 
After continuing to travel across the rocks for the next few days, Yvette had just about been able to eat and drink enough to keep her healthy, whilst managing to avoid all of her opponents during this time. However, on the evening of the ninth day, while she was getting ready to hide within the rocks for that evening, she heard a colossal noise come from far out into the ocean, before a large wave appeared and started slowly rolling in the direction of the island. As Yvette looked at the wave approaching, she noticed that there were other waves on the far left and far right of the horizon, also heading towards the island. Yvette wasted no time and ran up the hill before running back over the stony terrain and towards the cornucopia. As this tsunami grew closer and larger, it dawned on Yvette that she would not make it back to the cornucopia in time. As she panicked, she saw that some of the few trees in the arena were not too far away from where she was standing. Realising that this was likely to be her only hope, she ran to the tallest tree and started climbing it. She kept climbing and climbing as the wave covered the island and cannons started booming in the distance. After a minute, she made it to the top of the tree and gripped on as tightly as she could, while she saw the wave approach. When the wave hit the tree, Yvette was almost pushed off by the sheer force. It continued pushing the tree until eventually it snapped with the top half holding Yvette crashing down into the water and then being carried away by the current. Although she was submerged under the water for a few seconds by the current, although Yvette was submerged under the water for a few seconds by the current, she managed to resurface and continue to grip onto the remains of the tree, which acted like a makeshift raft. The tree continued moving with the current and after an hour the wave finally stopped before receding back into the ocean. Unlike Yvette, Hypatia, Needler from 8, and Polo from 9 had made it back to the higher central part of the arena. Furthermore, the three had managed to hide from each other, and so they each survived the wave. Yvette then spent the night sleeping on the branch of an old oak tree that had somehow managed to withstand the tsunami. However, the next day, Hypatia hunted down and killed both Needler and Polo, whilst Yvette kept her distance and then realised that she only had one opponent remaining. On the eleventh and final day, Yvette awoke to the game makers announcing that another large tsunami would shortly be on its way to the island. Realising that this was her cue to head back to the cornucopia, Yvette started running back as quickly as she could. Once she had made it back to the cornucopia, she frantically looked for a place to hide, but just as she was about to climb up another tree, a knife once again entered her shoulder and she immediately fell to the ground. Yvette looked over to see Hypatia walking towards her with her axe. She realised what was about to happen, and in a last-ditch attempt to survive, she ripped the knife out of her shoulder and wildly threw it at Hypatia. Out of sheer luck, the knife flew straight towards Hypatia, before hitting her straight in the middle of her brain. She then collapsed to her knees and her cannon ran out, whilst Yvette was stunned at her luck and the realisation that she had just become this year's victor. Upon returning to District 5, Yvette suffered from trauma that she had experienced within the games and developed crippling aquaphobia, although she managed to live a relatively peaceful life in the victor's village. She later died in the 75th Hunger Games. The 58th Games took place by a poisonous river. They featured venomous frogs, an oxygen drop, and lasted for seven days. At President Snow's request, this year's games were censored from Capital TV for the next three years, due to what he deemed to be an unsatisfactory ending for this year's games. This year's victor was Megan Hayes, aged 17, from District 6. Megan was reaped for the games just four days after giving birth to a son. When her name was called, her husband, Phoenix, and her parents shouted from the surrounding crowd that she had just had a baby, urging another female to volunteer herself in Megan's place. But they were quickly silenced by peacekeepers, and Megan was immediately marched up to the platform before anyone even had the chance to volunteer. When a weedy 14-year-old boy was chosen as the male tribute, Phoenix immediately tried to volunteer himself from the crowd but as he was 19, his pleas were ignored. However, his younger brother, Texas, volunteered himself instead, much to Phoenix, Megan, and the crowd's surprise. Throughout training, Megan still seemed disorientated and unengaged, and she occasionally muttered about seeing her baby. Texas tried to convince her to practice whilst they had the chance, and so she spent a lot of time at the paint station, camouflaging herself and claiming that this calmed her. When the games began and the platforms were raised, the tributes found themselves at the end of a long peninsula, which jutted out into the river that surrounded them, whilst mountainous forests rose into the distance on the other side of the river. As the countdown rocked past 15 and down to zero, Megan later revealed that it was at this point that she finally felt like she was no longer dreaming and that the games were really happening. Shortly before the gong sounded, Megan noticed that all the food and bottles were in plastic containers. 
Just as she was trying to understand why this was so, the gong sounded and she immediately ran away from the cornucopia before running straight to the peninsula's edge. Although she had not managed to grab any food or water, she hoped that like previous years there would be some food and water throughout the arena. The commentators also pointed out that she was probably used to going for prolonged periods without nutrition, with the lead commentator, Festus Creed, stating that this district was known for ingesting more morphling than food. Megan made it to the edge of the peninsula and was the first into the water before swimming away as quickly as she could. Although Megan had only swum twice before in her life, she made it across the river relatively quickly before resting by the water's edge in a wave of exhaustion. Once she recovered, she climbed a tree on the riverbank and watched as various tributes crossed the river, or at least tried to. However, she noticed that some who seemed to be swimming capably would suddenly stop moving and start to sink before their cannons sounded and their bodies were retrieved by the hovercraft. As Megan continued watching the river over this first day, she saw Hans and Belle, both from eight, swimming across and then reaching a point of the riverbank not very far to her left. She watched them carefully and saw that they had managed to get a plastic container containing a loaf of bread across the river with them. As she looked around the forest from this raised vantage point, she could see no food or even animals, and hence she decided that she would try to take this bread when she could. As evening set in, Megan heard Hans and Belle discussing their strategy for the next few days, and she also heard them mention that the careers had travelled in the opposite direction to them from the cornucopia meaning that unlike the vast majority of tributes, they had not travelled through the water, but had chosen to remain on land. Just as Megan was thinking about whether she would need to cross the river again, she heard Belle tell Hans that she would get some water from the river using the plastic container. Shortly afterwards, Megan heard two cannons go off almost simultaneously. As she was trying to figure out whose cannons they were, the hovercraft appeared very close to the tree in which she was resting, with the winds it was creating being so strong that they pushed Megan out of the tree and to the ground. Once she had fallen to the ground, she looked over and saw Hans and Belle's bodies under the light of the hovercraft before they were taken up by the body claw into the hovercraft which subsequently flew away into the night sky. Megan ran over and as she examined the area that had been Hans and Belle's base, she tried to understand what had killed them before looking at the plastic container and then realising that the water from the river was in fact poisonous. She also realised that tributes who had died on their way across the river must have accidentally swallowed some of the river water, which would have killed them. She felt fortunate as she was feeling thirsty and was planning on drinking from the river shortly afterwards, but she was pleased to be able to eat the bread that the pair had taken from the cornucopia. As the evening got colder, she also realised that Belle had taken off her jacket before she died, and this allowed Megan an extra layer of warmth. However, the next day, Megan spent time thinking about what had happened the previous day and how she would only be able to see her son again if she won the games. She therefore thought about her strategy for winning and realised that the best way for her to do this would be to camouflage herself whilst trapping other tributes and then killing them. At this point, Megan came up with a plan to use the empty container, various sized branches and the extra jackets to construct something that could look like a sleeping tribute. Once she had put these pieces together and covered it up, she placed it by the river's edge before finding a head-sized rock and painting it with various colours of mud from the river bank in order to look like a tribute's face. During the post-game analysis that replaced the victor's interview this year, the rock was shown to the audience and did in fact look eerily similar to a human face when placed at the right angle. Megan grabbed a stick and sharpened it into a weapon before climbing up a nearby tree and lying in wait for tributes to come and examine the body. Over the next three days, she successfully killed four lone tributes this way before taking whatever supplies they had and placing them by the body, which would entice even more tributes into investigating it. This plan worked well, and Megan's odds of victory dramatically increased until the fifth day when she spotted the three remaining careers swimming across the river towards her location. She considered running as there would be no way that she could ambush all three of these careers. However, they had now swung close enough to spot her as she ran away, and would likely catch her once they made it to the river bank. When they arrived at the shore, Persephone, from two, started to examine the body, but Quintus, from two, quickly warned her that this could be a trap. Megan even heard Shale, from one, saying that the sixes should be around here, before Persephone carefully removed the jackets, exposing the rocks and proving that this was indeed a trap. Very quickly after this, the careers looked up and to Megan's horror, they saw her in the trees. Persephone got an arrow ready to shoot, but just as she was about to let the arrow fly, a blue frog came flying out of nowhere and landed on her face. Before Persephone even had time to scream, the frog coughed a green liquid all over her cheek 
and it was at this point that she let out a scream. Quintus and Shale were confused by what was happening, and as Persephone scratched off the green liquid to reveal blotchy red pustules that were quickly worsening, another frog came flying towards Quintus before landing on his groin and coughing the green liquid onto his trousers, which eroded through the fabric and caused him to let out a spine-chilling howl. To Megan's surprise, her district partner, Texas, suddenly appeared from along the riverbank, with leaves attached to his hands before Shale sprinted away from him through the forest. Quintus and Persephone were now on the floor, crippled in pain and clutching their respective wounds. Megan watched Texas march over to each of them before slitting their throats with a sword and killing them instantly. He then stood at the bottom of Megan's tree and told her to come down. He then signalled at the approaching hovercraft and said that they needed to leave now before the others came along. As they walked away in the other direction from Shale, Texas took off the leaves that had been stuck to his hands, which he said he had to use in order to touch the venomous frogs. Megan asked Texas how he had known where the careers were, to which he replied that he had been watching Megan from nearby since the first evening. They remained together by the riverbank until the sixth day, when the number of tributes had dwindled to just six. The game makers then announced that the oxygen levels in the arena would drop, and within an hour, the only way to breathe would be to have a mask that could be taken from the cornucopia. Texas and Megan decided to return to the peninsula as quickly as they could, and carefully swam across the river with their respective weapons, whilst being both careful to not swallow any of the river water, but at the same time to not make themselves visible to the other tributes who may be watching from the peninsula. After about half an hour, the pair reached the shore, but within just seconds of making it, Natasha, from Seven, came out from behind a tree and ran straight at Megan. Texas yelled out in order to warn Megan, but it was too late. However, Natasha slipped on some wet mud just before she was going to stab Megan, which meant that her axe entered Megan's shoulder instead of her head. But she still screamed out in pain as she hit the floor. Texas ran over whilst Natasha tried to dislodge her axe from Megan's shoulder, which was now causing her even more pain. But just as she finally freed her axe, Texas slammed his sword straight through Natasha's stomach, killing her in a matter of seconds. Texas then rushed to Megan's side, and fearing that she would soon bleed out and die, he took off his t-shirt and jacket, before pressing them onto the wound and stopping her from bleeding further, while she spent the next half hour passing in and out of consciousness. The game makers then announced that the masks were now ready to be collected, and Texas seemed conflicted about whether or not he should collect a mask or stay with Megan, but eventually she summoned up the strength to tell him to grab a mask for them. As Texas ran to the cornucopia, Megan passed out again. When he arrived, he managed to grab a mask, while Shale was stabbing Heron from four to death, and Kabea from ten, and Partridge from eleven were trying to strangle each other. Once Texas had made it back to Megan, only they and Shale were still alive. The pair of them spent the next hour sharing the mask between them, until the oxygen levels returned to normal. That night, Texas hardly got any sleep, as he was still caring for Megan, whose wound was continuing to worsen. Every now and then, she would awaken and say that she thought she was going to die. However, Texas revealed to Megan that before leaving District 6, he had told Phoenix that in return for looking after him when their parents had died, he would do everything in his power to make sure that Megan would come back to him and be able to see her baby again. Although Megan appeared to hear what Texas was saying, she later claimed that she had no memory of this due to her physical state at the time. Throughout the night, Texas tried to stay awake as long as he possibly could in order to protect Megan but as the sun rose, he started to doze off. However, it was then that Shale suddenly came up behind Texas and tried to stab him in the neck. Texas heard Shale in the nick of time and dodged this knife attack before rolling out of the way. Shale carried on running towards Texas, but after an exhausting minute of fighting, in which the pair had managed to stab each other roughly three times each, Shale suddenly stopped moving and blood flowed from his mouth. As he dropped to the ground, Megan appeared behind him, and Texas realised that she had somehow managed to get up before impaling Shale through the back of his throat with her wooden stick. Just as Shale's cannon sounded, Megan also dropped to the ground, and Texas rushed to try and help her back up, but he noticed that her shoulder was still not healing, and the wound had now turned a worrying colour. Now realising that Megan would soon die if she did not receive medical help urgently, Texas held her hand, and whilst Megan was within an episode of consciousness, he asked Megan to tell his nephew, Peter, that his uncle Texas loved him very much. Megan blinked in accordance, and after closing his eyes and taking a few deep breaths, Texas slit his own throat, killing himself and leaving a now barely living Megan as the victor. Whilst Texas became very popular amongst the districts, and was lauded as a hero for his selflessness, President Snow and the game makers were not so pleased with his actions, 
seeing them as rebellious and going against the nature of the games. Therefore, this year's games were removed from Capital TV and not shown again for several years. Meanwhile, Meghan very nearly died from her injuries during the weeks following the games. Once she recovered, President Snow punished her by having her parents and husband, Phoenix, executed on live television, whilst her son was adopted by a couple who lived in the capital. Due to the trauma of fighting in the games and then losing her family, Meghan turned to Morphling in order to ease her pain before dying in the 75th Hunger Games. The 59th Games took place in a bamboo forest. They featured deceptive pandas, an intense hurricane, and lasted for eight days. This year's games once again proved that there is nothing more dangerous than a humiliated career tribute. This year's victor was Plato Hamasaki, age 17, from District 2. During the bloodbath, Plato and the other careers quickly grabbed some swords and scythes, which they used to kill as many of their strongest competitors as they could. With Plato successfully chasing down and killing Coilio from 3 and Warp from 8, as they tried to flee from the main clearing and into the bamboo forest. Once all the surviving tributes had fled the clearing, they gathered all their supplies and placed them into a pile within the clearing, which Moonshine, from one, agreed to guard. Meanwhile, Plato, Octavia, from two, and Mal, from one, proceeded into the forest in an effort to find any tributes who might still be in the vicinity. However, they found that the bamboo in the forest that immediately surrounded the cornucopia was packed extremely closely together. Therefore, due to the career's more muscular frames, it made it quite difficult for them to work their way through the bamboo. In fact, they even heard laughter at one point, not very far away from their location, when Mal got his head stuck between two bamboo sticks. After almost an hour had passed, Plato, Octavia and Mal finally made it through this tightly packed bamboo, and after deciding that they did not want to challenge or humiliate themselves any further by having to pass through it again, they shouted at Moonshine to take whatever supplies she could and join them in the forest. Luckily for her, she was of a slender frame, and made it through the bamboo relatively quickly. Once she had made it to where the other careers were, they spent the rest of that day hunting the other tributes, and they found and killed Andres and Stormy, both from five, that evening. On the second day, they woke early and ate some bread from their supplies. However, whilst Plato and Mal were discussing where they should head next, and Moonshine was relieving herself in a nearby bush, Octavia noticed a small panda walk towards their camp. Having never seen one of these animals before, she found him rather adorable, and even laughed at the way he ate the bamboo leaves. However, once the panda heard Octavia's laugh, he looked over to her and his eyes gradually widened with anger. Just as Octavia was about to call Plato to alert him, the panda jumped forward and savagely bit Octavia's neck. She pushed off the panda and Plato sprang into action, immediately stabbing the now irate panda with a sword. Marl and Moonshine surrounded Octavia and tried to put pressure on her wound, but when Moonshine discreetly shook her head at Marl, he snapped Octavia's neck, killing her instantly. The careers spent the rest of the day hunting for other tributes, but were surprisingly unable to find anyone else before dusk of that day. After Moonshine was bitten on the leg shortly after waking up on the third day, she insisted to Plato and Mole that they go back to the cornucopia with all the supplies they had, so they would be safe from the pandas and potentially able to wait for other tributes to come back to the cornucopia whilst fleeing from the pandas. Despite being initially sceptical of this plan, the boys eventually agreed and accompanied Moonshine through the tightly packed bamboo and into the cornucopia clearing. Mal joked that he was glad he had not got his head stuck again, and Plato was clearly seen by a camera rolling his eyes at this comment. However, the trio stayed in this clearing until the end of the fourth day, and ultimately avoided any more danger during this time. By noon on the fifth day, there were still ten tributes remaining, just as the careers were about to have something to eat, they suddenly heard screaming from the nearby forest. They were unsure as to whether or not this was a trap, but they noticed that the screams were moving, which made it seem like someone was chasing whoever was screaming, and hence it seemed more authentic. Without much discussion, the three careers all rushed to their feet and chased the screaming sounds, which were still moving through the forest. Moonshine and Plato made it through the initial forest fairly quickly this time, However, Mull once again got his head stuck between some bamboo plants and shouted out to Moonshine and Plato that he would wait for them there. He pretended to laugh it off to the cameras, but even an inexperienced viewer could tell that he was dying of embarrassment on the inside. However, once Plato and Moonshine were still trying to chase the screaming through the less dense forest, Mull suddenly heard a young girl's voice shout out, Salix, you're right, he did it again, before he was stabbed through the head with a spear made of bamboo. At the angle that Mull's head had been at, 
he was unable to see that a spry little thing named Twiggy from Seven had just come up behind him with a bamboo shoot. The screaming near Plainto and Moonshine suddenly stopped and Marl's cannon went off. Twiggy then climbed up the bamboo, using Marl's head as a makeshift step in order to climb up quicker. She climbed between the bamboo sticks and kept heading further and further from Plato and Moonshine until she found Salix from Seven in a nearby clearing. After suffering this humiliating defeat, Plato and Moonshine spent the rest of the fifth day and most of the sixth day hunting through the arena until they eventually found Stalix and Twiggy holding onto the top of some bamboo sticks. Moonshine tried to fire arrows at them but missed, much to Stalix and Twiggy's amusement. Plato then started chopping at the bottom of the sticks being used by the pair, but they once again giggled as they continued jumping from stick to stick, away from Plato. At one point, whilst looking upwards as he tried to chop the stick between Stalix, Plato ran straight into a stick and hurt his nose. This made Stalix and Twiggy laugh so loudly that Twiggy almost fell from her stick, whilst even Moonshine struggled to contain her laughter at Plato's accident. However, Plato failed to see the funny side, and walked straight over to Moonshine before rather shockingly stabbing her through the heart. As her body fell to the ground, Stalix and Twiggy finally stopped laughing. However, whilst Plato was trying to regain his composure, Stalix patronisingly asked, Are you having a bad day? to Plato, which then made the pair start cackling and shrieking all over again. That evening, Plato became rather enraged as the pair received an array of sponsor gifts for having entertained the capital with their antics. When Plato awoke the next day, there were just five tributes remaining. He got up but saw no sign of Stalix or Twiggy, and so he decided to walk through the arena in the hope of finding them. However, whilst he was walking, he noticed that winds were starting to flow through the forest. At first, the bamboo leaves were hardly moving, but within a matter of minutes, the winds had become so strong that the bamboo sticks were swaying and falling, with some even breaking in half. Luckily for Plato, as he was running to find some shelter from the falling bamboo sticks, one of these sticks not far from him smashed to the ground, and he was delighted to see that a now injured Twiggy had just been thrown from it. Twiggy started running when she saw Plato, but he very quickly caught up with her and smashed her head into the ground. As she screamed out, he continued bashing her head against the ground over and over again, until the surrounding area was covered in her blood. Once she was almost dead, Plato grabbed her by her head and impaled her on a nearby stick, that had had its top broken off, with the stick now coming through Twiggy's mouth. Stalix, who was aghast at what he had just seen, froze in shock, and after Plato gave it a violent shaking, he fell to the ground. Plato grabbed him instantly by the collar, then impaled his head through the same stick that had Twiggy on it, which killed him instantly as well. The hurricane immediately died down, and Plato spent the rest of the day sleeping and preparing for whichever final battle awaited him. However, he felt a sense of peace in the fact that he had finally brought a grisly end to the tributes who had humiliated him so badly. He was especially proud of the fact that the hovercraft had had so much trouble removing Salix and Twiggy's bodies from the arena that they had to send in a special hovercraft which was able to uproot the bamboo stick to which their bodies were attached. As Plato awoke on the eighth day, he tried to think of which tributes could still be remaining, but whilst he was contemplating this, he noticed that the bamboo sticks were once again moving with the wind, but this time they were swaying in the direction of the cornucopia, which made Plato realise that it was time to return there. He ran back as quickly as he could, and whilst he was waiting in the densely packed bamboo, he spied Goldie, from four, strangling her district partner, Marinos. Plato then ran in as quickly as possible so that Goldie would still hopefully be worn out after the tiring task of strangulation. As Plato approached, she tried to fight him off with her own sword, but he quickly disarmed her, before stabbing her in the throat killing her instantly and taking this year's win. After Plato returned to District 2, it was to his surprise that he was mainly ridiculed by his fellow citizens for being part of what was dubbed as the ineptest career pack of all time. He therefore moved to the capital and spent most of his days teaching self-defence. However, it was noted that in the games following this year, there was a huge increase in the amount of volunteers from the career districts, with many of these volunteers claiming that they could do better than what they had seen in this year's games. It is hotly debated as to whether or not this influenced the higher amount of wins from career tributes that followed over the next decade. The 60th games took place in Glacier Caves. They featured irate penguins, a sonic surge, and lasted for 12 days. This year's games became notorious for featuring some violent yet accidentally entertaining animals, along with some of the most graphic deaths that had ever been witnessed in the games. This year's victor was Cecilia Sanchez, aged 18, from District 8. As the countdown made its way down to zero, 
Several tributes exchanged worried looks as they found themselves shivering from the icy cold, but Cecilia was one of few tributes who instead noticed that there was no water present within this cornucopia. Realising that they might have to extract water from the glaciers above the cave, Cecilia wanted to grab one of the pickaxes that she could see in the cornucopia, but at the same time she had promised her mentor, Freya, that she would not grab a weapon. Cecilia therefore aimed for a box of matches not too far from her podium that she hoped could melt the overhead glaciers and provide water. Cecilia ran and grabbed the matches quickly, but as she was about to turn in order to run from the cornucopia, she saw a pack of biscuits not far away to her right. In a split second, she decided to grab these biscuits, but just as she ran after grabbing them as well, she was tackled to the ground by Coquina from one. However, just as Coquina raised her arm to stab Cecilia with a knife, Forrest from Seven rammed his axe into the back of Coquina's head, which immediately killed her. Cecilia grabbed the matches and biscuits before getting up and running, but just as she was running, she looked back to see Forrest struggling to get to his axe out of Coquina's head, whilst Gerald from Nine approached him with another axe. Feeling like she owed Forrest, she screamed at him to watch out, which alerted him to Gerald's presence and allowed him to duck as the axe was swung towards him. Gerald lost his balance and Forrest then punched his face before snatching the axe from him and running away in Cecilia's direction. The pair ran away and travelled towards the perimeter until they found a relatively spacious ice cave where they stayed for the rest of the day. They spent the night taking turns sleeping and keeping watch and felt relatively safe by the second day. However, neither of them had been able to drink any water and were starting to feel extremely thirsty. Cecilia suggested lighting one of the matches and holding it beneath the roof of the cave which could melt the glacier and cause water to fall for them. However, when they tried this, it failed to melt the glacier, and Cecilia did not want to keep wasting matches. Forrest then offered to use his pickaxe in order to break through the glacier and cause water to flow out. At first, Cecilia agreed to this, but after several minutes of no water flowing through, she suggested to Forrest that he should abandon this plan. However, Forrest either did not hear Cecilia or chose to ignore her, as he continued to smash away at the glacier. Just as Cecilia started hearing a high-pitched cracking from just above where Forrest was chiselling, she realised what was about to happen and started running. A few seconds later, Forrest gave the glacier a final whack, before the central roof of this cave came collapsing down onto him and killed him instantly. Luckily for Cecilia, she only received a minor cut on her leg, and she had her matches and biscuits on her, so she ran from the cave before it could collapse any further. Over the next two days, Cecilia continued walking through the labyrinth of caves, whilst managing to avoid the other tributes. However, on the fourth day, Cecilia started to feel extremely dizzy from thirst. She was still trying to use the matches, but most of the caves that seemed to have the clearest glaciers, which she thought would provide water, were too high for her to reach, even when holding up the lit matches. Luckily for Cecilia, she heard a banging sound from a nearby cave on the fourth day. As she peered into the cave, she spotted Tablet from Three, Tasmanio from Eleven, and her district partner, Jeremiah, chiselling away at the roof of the cave. Tasmanio was extremely tall, and Cecilia hoped that if she allied with this group, then Tasmanio would be tall enough to use the matches effectively. As Tablet continued hammering away at the clearest part of the roof, Cecilia casually walked in and said that they would kill themselves if they carried on. The boys twisted round and looked at her for a few tense seconds without even knowing what to say. She then produced the matches from her pocket, and directly addressing Tasmanio, told him that he would be tall enough to use them. The trio realised that their current plan was not working, and so they agreed to ally with Cecilia. After Tasmanio lit a match beneath a clear part of the cave's roof, a trickle of water gradually started to come through, which finally allowed the four of them to drink. They then spent the next two days hiding out in this cave and drinking water from the steady flow that came through the roof. Before sunset, Tasmania was also lucky enough to be gifted by sponsors with some logs of wood. Although he and the others were at first confused, Cecilia pointed out that they could use this to start a fire and even cook something. Tasmania started the fire by using Cecilia's matches. However, as the boys continued building the fire, Cecilia thought she heard what sounded like an angry chicken, which was getting louder and seemed to be nearing the cave. Jeremiah readied his pickaxe and slowly walked outside into a bigger clearing. Within seconds, he ran back in and shouted that there was a big black and white chicken outside the cave. Cecilia was curious to see what this animal was, and when she left the cave with Jeremiah, she recognised this animal as a penguin, from an old nature book that her father had kept. Although these animals did not traditionally seem to be violent, as soon as this penguin looked over at Cecilia, she saw the rage in its eyes, and she and Jeremiah quickly headed back to the cave from which they had come. 
Cecilia and Jeremiah reported their findings to Tasmania and Tablet, and Jeremiah and Tasmania headed back out to try and grab this penguin, while Cecilia and Tablet took care of the fire. However, within a few minutes of Jeremiah and Tasmania leaving the cave, a cannon boomed out, and Jeremiah ran back in, screaming that Tasmania had been bitten by a huddle of the penguins who had attacked him from behind. Cecilia was at first sceptical about this story, but when she rewatched the games, she realised that he was telling the truth. Therefore, she, Jeremiah, and Tablet ate the supplies that they already had and put out the fire so that it didn't melt away the roof of the cave. The trio remained in the cave until day six, when there were 12 tributes left. As they woke up that morning, the game makers announced that a sonic surge would be released from the cornucopia in 10 minutes' time, and that the only way tributes could stop this sound from killing them would be to grab a set of ear protectors from the cornucopia. Cecilia, Jeremiah and Tablet all jumped to their feet and ran as quickly as they could back to the cornucopia cave. When they arrived, they hid behind the small glaciers surrounding this large cave and looked at the countdown, which was nearing two minutes. Cecilia was surprised that nobody had yet approached the ear protector platform, but quietly whispered to the others that someone would have to make a move soon. Suddenly, a huddle of penguins waddled quickly into the other side of the cornucopia cave, squawking loudly as they moved. Cecilia was confused as to why they had suddenly entered, but at that moment, one of the larger penguins started pecking the floor, and then Montana, from Six, suddenly sprung out of the spot in the floor, pushing the penguin out of the way and grabbing some ear protectors. It then became clear that she had managed to camouflage herself beforehand. However, as she ran away, a spear flew straight through her head from another angle in the cornucopia cave, and the careers quickly revealed themselves from behind the glaciers. It was then that all chaos ensued when the majority of tributes ran for some ear protectors, with the careers chucking spears and axes at other tributes whilst they tried to dodge these weapons and make their way to the platform. The penguins' loud squawking and clumsy waddling also made the whole scene more chaotic for the tributes, but more amusing for the capital. However, some tributes were managing to grab the ear protectors before running away, with Charlie from 5 managing to stab Smolder from 1 before grabbing his ear protectors and fleeing. Cecilia, Jeremiah and Tablet were in the minority of tributes who had not yet entered the cornucopia. With 30 seconds left before the sonic surge began, Tablet pointed out that they had a better chance of success if they all ran in together, which they proceeded to do. Most tributes had now either escaped or been slain by Beatus and Tanaquil, both from two, who were now the only careers still standing, and whilst Beatus was busy slaying Enrique from ten, Tanaquil saw Cecilia, Jeremiah and Tablet approaching. Tanaquil threw a spear straight at Tablet, who managed to duck, but it still caught him in the shoulder, and he fell to the ground before she attacked him again. With 15 seconds left before the sonic surge, Jeremiah grabbed a pair of ear protectors and ran, urging Cecilia to come with him. However, Cecilia, who had just grabbed the last ear protectors, froze as she saw Tablet lying injured on the ground whilst considering if she could help him. Jeremiah then fled from the cornucopia without Cecilia, whilst Tablet painfully got to his feet with just 6 seconds remaining. As he looked at the timer, then back at Cecilia, who was wearing the last pair of ear protectors, Cecilia realised what he was about to do. As Tablet charged at Cecilia, she screamed and turned to run, whilst clutching the ear protectors to her head. Tablet tackled her to the ground and desperately tried to loosen her grip, but just a second later, Cecilia instinctively squeezed her eyes shut when she heard a piercing sound booming from the platform, accompanied by a shrill scream from Tablet. Immediately following this, Cecilia was covered in Tablet's blood. Cecilia later said that this was the longest minute of her life, but once the sonic surge was over, she was able to release her grip on the ear protectors. She looked over to where she had last seen Tablet and saw that there was nothing left of him, except for a red hue surrounding the area where he had been, while some of his clothing had been thrown in different directions around the cornucopia cave. After taking a few minutes to compose herself, Cecilia slowly walked away from the cornucopia, while still in a state of shock, until she found refuge in another nearby cave and collapsed into a deep sleep. Unbeknownst to Cecilia, she slept for approximately a day and a half, without being awoken by the cannons of Tanaquil, Alexa from 3, or Marlboro from 12. When she awoke during the very early morning of the 10th day, she was freezing cold and quietly begged for anything to keep her warm. As this was an underground cave, she had no idea how the sponsorship gifts could even be delivered, but just minutes later she heard a thud from outside the main cave. She carefully peered out from the cave's opening, worried that it might be another tribute, but through the cave's darkness she could just about see that a sleeping bag had been dropped, with a number 8 printed on the side. 
As she grabbed it, she looked up and could just about make out the circular outline of a hole through which this gift had been dropped. She quickly took the sleeping bag and returned to her previous cave before sleeping for the rest of that night. Late on the tenth day, Cecilia awoke again in the cave, but this time she was extremely hungry. She felt like asking for food but did not want to seem needy, and therefore she roamed the arena for the rest of the day and that night, aiming to find anything she could that was edible. However, shortly after midnight she heard a loud squawking from a nearby cave, and a cannon roared out, before she spotted a death claw appear from the roof of the larger cave, and then extending itself over to the other cave. After a few seconds of moving and rotating, it detracted itself and was holding the body of Charlie, which it continued to pull up into the roof of the cave. Cecilia was wary of the penguins, but she also considered that Charlie might have useful supplies. She therefore waited in another nearby cave until she spotted that the penguins had waddled away, before she checked inside the cave and saw Charlie's food and his sword. Cecilia therefore chose to stay there until late that evening, when she noticed that even with her sleeping bag, the cave was starting to feel very cold indeed. Once she noticed how cold it was, she looked out of the cave and to her surprise, the walls of the cave were starting to turn extremely white and icicles were quickly forming on the roof of the cave before breaking off and smashing to the floor. After one of these icicles fell extremely close to Cecilia, she ran back into the cave and grabbed the sword, realising that the showdown was now imminent. She then continued running through the darkness back to the cornucopia as the intense frost continued rolling in behind her. As Cecilia continued running back, she heard a cannon ring out, which was in fact Jeremiah, after he had tripped and then become frozen, before some icicles fell on top of his frozen body and smashed it into smithereens. However, Cecilia made it back to the cornucopia and hid behind the glaciers, but she was unable to see Beatus anywhere. Just as she heard some squawking behind her, she quickly jumped over the glaciers and into the cornucopia cave. Immediately realising how exposed she now was, Cecilia continued checking around at all angles, before Beatus jumped over the glaciers at the opposite side of the cave and ran towards her. She then readied her sword for him to approach, but just as Beatus was running towards her, he threw a spear, which Cecilia narrowly avoided. However, the spear had hurtled straight past her and hit one of the larger penguins in the head, killing it instantly. Beatus then got another spear ready, but as he continued charging towards Cecilia, three more penguins quickly waddled up towards him, and then as he was about to throw it, his feet were violently pecked by these penguins before he collapsed to the floor in pain. Cecilia turned her back as more and more penguins flocked towards Beatus and his screams echoed through the cave. She crouched to her knees and covered her ears before she was quickly removed by the death claw of the Cornucopia Cave. After achieving victory, Cecilia returned to District 8, and after a few difficult years, she recovered from the psychological trauma that she had experienced within the games. She started dating a well-known textile designer within the district, and they got married that year. They went on to have a son and two daughters together, before Cecilia was killed in the 75th Hunger Games. Furthermore, their youngest daughter, Crochette, also competed in the 76th Games, which are now more commonly known as the Reclamation Games. However, she experienced an extremely violent death in which her throat was violently ripped out by another tribute.